got it. In 1984, film audiences were introduced to a new kind of villain. You're terminated. Seven years later, writer-director James Cameron has re-teamed with stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton for the long-awaited sequel. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. If it is little children today or grown-ups, the one line that everyone always asks me to say is, you know, say, I'll be back, say that line, come on now. Are you gonna be back or what? <laughs> cybernetic organism. Cyberdan Systems Model 101. I'll be back. Those words took on new meaning in the fall of 1990 when cast and crew reunited in the Mojave Desert to continue the story of Sarah Connor and her fight against the machines of the future. The important element that's changed in her life since we saw her last is that she's had her son, John Connor, and he's now 10 years old. The new Terminator of the film is not targeted on her anymore. The child now himself is the target. Okay. Set. For Cameron, Terminator 2 was only a matter of time. Action. It was inevitable that a Terminator sequel would get made, and I wanted to be at the helm. I wanted to make sure it didn't kind of drift off the concept of what it should be about. Cameron's vision of a killer cyborg from the future hit a chord with audiences worldwide. The Terminator represented something to people, a kind of a, a dark side of the human psyche. People want to uh, have that fantasy of being able to do exactly what they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do it. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> you forgot to say please. It took us all, I think, a while to realize that the Terminator had kind of permeated into the culture and it just kept getting reflected back to me in so many ways. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. Arnold was always a very strong force in trying to get the sequel made. I have said to Jim Cameron, I said, you know, we should have an ongoing story because we're dealing here with such an interesting subject. I knew, instinct told me that based on the, the strength of the first film, um, that there would be another one. Um, it's just, you're never ready. <laughs> Several of the original Terminator crew returned for the sequel, including director of photography Adam Greenberg and Terminator effects creator Stan Winston. The uh, sequel must be true to the first film, but yet it must be more than the first film. We have to give them what they got in the first, and we have to give them something new and fresh. And I think that's what we've done in Terminator 2. How can Arnold be starring in the sequel? A Terminator is built in a factory, and there's one after another after another, and they all look like Arnold. I guess it's just because he's cute. This Terminator, however, isn't just another pretty face. There's more sophistication to the, the, the way it will look, and bigger, much bigger uh, things will happen on the screen. For six months, Terminator 2 combined the efforts of over a thousand filmmakers shooting day and night throughout the state of California to capture the many action sequences of the script. The production actually changed the course of a river to shoot high-speed chases in the extensive flood control channels of Los Angeles. Roll, guys, roll. The tight quarters and massive filming equipment often paralleled the action of the scenes being shot. A 
defunct steel mill was resurrected by the filmmakers, recreating the intense heat and light of molten steel. Ironically, actual temperatures in the mill averaged 42 degrees, making it difficult for the actors to work up a sweat. And in Northern California, a team of expert pyrotechnicians staged one of the largest police shootouts in cinematic history. Their crowning achievement, however, was blowing up a four-story office building. Were we supposed to roll? That's good. <laughs> that was a rehearsal. I'm waiting for your cue, Jim. <laughs> Arnold and I working together, it's just, it's just like it was on the first picture. He's one of the most professional people I've ever worked with. He has incredible concentration. He takes physical direction like no actor I've ever worked with. And it's really a joy to work with him. Yeah, exactly. It's really it's part of the shoot. It was before my method acting uh, seminar. <laughs> Although then, in 1984, he paid a lot of attention to the acting he pays much more attention to the acting now. The way he goes about directing actors, how much time he spends with rehearsals, how much time he spends with perfection and with moves and gestures. I think you both go, and then freeze. So I would say that in that area, he's much smarter and much more sophisticated. I mean, he wants to do basically everything because he has such a clear vision of what he wants to see and see him ending up running with the smoke machine and creating smoke in front of the camera and then putting on blood and doing, trying to do your makeup. That's why people always say that the Jim Cameron movie has a certain look because it's a total representation of what he wants to see. Long before the cameras roll, Cameron and crew are hard at work designing sequences and testing ideas in a unique mix of filmmaking and science. I do a lot of uh, visual research, I do a lot of technical research. The more fantastic the subject, the more realistic the, the situation needs to be. Using extremely detailed models, Cameron designs sequences with the aid of a thumb-sized video camera. By blocking the scene in miniature, production designer Joe Nemec can alter a location or set to meet the specific needs of the scene. Also during pre-production, an ex-Israeli commando provided the cast with military combat and weapons training. Since the character of Sarah has become an expert marksman, Linda was required to master a variety of guns and assault rifles. It was really like entering the military and, and learning the mindset and um, coming up against myself in a big way. That was even more significant in terms of playing Sarah. Okay, very good. She has so set herself down a path, a concentrated path of, of duty, that she's lost all touch with her son. You cannot risk yourself even for me. Do you understand? You're too important. She's a great warrior, but for what? You know, so what? She doesn't have anything that makes it worth while, you know, and also my life. <laughs> it's like oh, we don't even we don't even notice the gunshot anymore. Why does it want me? It was a nuclear war. Sarah has lived with this, the certain knowledge of the destruction of the world on a certain date for so long that it haunts her dreams and, and nightmares every night and it's driven her kind of to the point of madness, really, as it would anybody who really had to this confront that knowledge. Because I knew it happened! It happened! We experience the end of the world through Sarah's eyes, a process that called for the strictest sense of realism. But even more powerful and haunting, are Sarah's visions up. of the people. And he comes down, and action, he jumps off and covers up. Ho oh, ho, stop. <laughs> What'd you do, see Commando 10 times? <laughs> when we had to create ashen bodies that were going to be blown away by a nuclear holocaust, 
it was very unsettling. And it was the one time when you got a little uncomfortable because it wasn't pleasant to look at while you were shooting it. But it is the important aspect of the film. Judgment Day, the day Sarah was told the war would start, clearing the path for humanity's successor. The machines. Future War, for Terminator 2, Cameron mobilized an army of actors, stunt people, and special effects crews to create the final battle between humanity and the machines. This battle took place on many levels in Terminator 2, as the crew executed one successful vehicle stunt after another. That is a cut! That is a cut! One scene required the Terminator to climb from a speeding pickup onto a heavy tanker, a feat performed by Arnold's stunt double, Peter Kent. After a successful spin-out, the truck was rolled onto its side and dragged by a team of tractors. Peter rode the sliding tanker like a surfboard. To protect young John Connor, the human resistance has sent the Terminator itself. My mission is to protect you. Who sent you? You did. Oh, this is deep. Playing the role of young John Connor is newcomer Eddie Furlong. It's almost, in a way, the classic, the classic story. I mean, he literally was just plucked off the streets of Pasadena and uh, whipped into the vortex of, uh, of making a movie. And Jim said, Eddie, I was going to tell you Friday, but don't tell anybody. But we're gonna, we picked you for this film. And I, I felt like hugging Jim, but he's a guy, so I didn't hug him. Cast with less than a month before production, Eddie began an intense period of preparation in addition to his regular education, he received physical training, acting lessons, and motorcycle classes. Funny thing is, I'm sure it's nothing like anything he ever expected, and it's a total left turn in his life. But on the other hand, children have this remarkable capacity to just deal with things, whatever life throws them. They don't know how the world is supposed to be yet, so they just think, that's, that's okay, you know, it can be like this if it wants to be. One of the many tasks Stan Winston and crew undertook was enhancing the original Terminator makeup design. Originally, there were a, a number of stages designed or considered as Arnold stages in makeups for this particular production. An actor must know going into a situation like this that there is physical stress with this process. Fortunately, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a, is a pro. Three more hours of this. I don't know how much longer I can take this. He attacks it as a pro. He doesn't complain. All right. But I need my foot massages, my oatmeal, my Austrian Christmas music. I need it all. Go ahead. Do it. This pre-made-up piece here is going to be glued to Arnold's face with the help of Arnold holding it. Hold on a second. Okay, now, it's the glue we use. It makes these arms pop up and get all swollen. On days when the makeup doesn't turn out 100%, I just sneak by the camera and rub a little Vaseline on the lens, and then everything looks fine. But don't tell the DP that. He gets really upset. <laughs> this was so funny. <laughs> During the production, makeup artists Jeff Don and Steve Laporte and hairdresser Peter Tothball would transform Arnold into the flesh-covered Terminator an estimated 35 times, totaling six consecutive days in a makeup chair for Arnold. Not too much, because if you put too much blood on it, it uh, doesn't, you, you can't see the work that's been done. You can't see the metal and the flesh that's gone. It just looks like a big bloody mess, like you slap some hamburger on it. 
That's a good example, Jeff. Hamburger? I'm proud of it. Well, I'm hungry right now, so I thought I'd use hamburger. <laughs> People accept this possibility that there can be a, a blend between a human component and a machine component. And I think it's just an aspect of our lives right now that we're so surrounded by machines all the time. And the fact that we can accept that to me is the most amazing thing of all. What it is is I'm too handsome. No camera can take all these good looks. So what they do in every movie basically is, is they put appliances on and terrible makeup on to kind of tone my looks down a little bit. So I match up to the rest of the actors in the movie. I'm, so I'm, tell me, Linda, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I'm a little too pretty too for this movie, so. All right. Wow! <laughs> Was my breath that bad? Two and a half, three hours, and he's done. The next stage for the makeup is stage five, six, seven. And it's basically the same that Arnold had before, just more chrome, more appliances. He'll have his eye plugged up so he won't be able to see out of it. And uh, it'll take probably an hour, hour and a half longer to put on. He's going to love it. As one might imagine, Sarah has trouble accepting the Terminator as an ally. Although she doesn't know that he's going to come back, she knows that it's a possibility, so she's ready. No affection, you know, I, I've kept it really clean. Do you know what you're doing? I've detailed files on the human anatomy. I bet. Makes you a more efficient killer, right? Correct. Terminator in this film adopts no, 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 certain no, no, no. human characteristics. You gotta listen to the way people talk. And if someone comes off to you with an attitude, you say, hasta la vista, baby. Hasta la vista, baby. That character slowly develops uh, by the very fact of hanging around a human being. Jesus, you're gonna kill that guy. Of course, I'm a Terminator. <sighs> listen to me very carefully, okay? You're not a Terminator anymore, all right? And, and all that registers, and I start dealing with all those uh, kind of emotions. The Terminator sent to kill young John is unlike any killing machine ever imagined. I call him a, a mimetic polyalloy, meaning that, it, that, that he's made of a substance that can imitate anything. Playing the T-1000 is Robert Patrick. Jim was looking for somebody that was sort of a mixture between the protector character, which was Michael Biehn in the first, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was, uh, which is the Terminator. And I think he was looking for somebody that could look like he could possibly just be a human, and yet could be uh, a Terminator, could handle the intensity to be in a Terminator. Well, I wanted to find someone who would be a good contrast to, to Arnold. If the 800 series is a kind of human panzer tank, then the 1000 series had to be a Porsche an advanced prototype Terminator who was uh, more fearsome than the old model. The thing I like about Robert was he, he kind of looks like a cat in a way. It's almost like it's about senses with him. You know, he, you feel that he's very in touch with the, with the world and analyzing it and observing it. My character wants to completely take out John Connor. That's his mission. A relentless tenacious killing machine and he won't stop though their missions are exact opposites both terminators stem from the same creator the unseen supercomputer called skynet so it's like this is the first time you've had to deal with evil because right. terminators don't fight terminators right it's never happened we stem from the same technology so we've got to have some like programming there are you the legal guardian of john connor that's right, officer. What's he done now? So we're both killing machines. We're just different types. There was a guy here this morning looking for him, too. Yeah, a big guy on a bike. Has that got something to do with this? The, the, the new Terminator, really, with his new capabilities, is, is, is much more threatening. Now I'm basically deaf. You know, they're running from death. Both Terminators are programmed to complete their missions at all costs and without question. But Sarah has decided to confront her destiny and takes matters into her own hands. I need to know how Skynet gets built. Who's responsible? The main most directly responsible is Miles Bennett Dyson. She decides that the only way to stop the future that she knows is going to happen is to kill the man 
that builds the chip that starts the war. In a very real way, she becomes the terminator of the, of the second film, at least at a kind of a psychological level. For cast and crew, Terminator 2 has been more than a reunion. It has been very intense to work, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of night shooting and a lot of long hours and so on. And I'm very honored and happy that I'm able to do the second one. In 1984, Cameron transformed Arnold into one of the screen's most memorable villains. Seven years later, the process is reversing itself. The Terminator is becoming a protector. Ultimately, the film is about the value of human life. No matter how inconsequential you may seem to others or even to yourself, your individual existence may have great value in the future. Grab it, go! Go! No! No! They have a job to do, protect her son, and they do it. One of the most amazing aspects of Terminator 2 is that it's taken the art and science of special effects to an entirely new level. Several Academy Award-winning effects companies worked under a strict veil of secrecy for almost a year to create the many and varied effects of Terminator 2. Action! Fantasy 2, under the command of Terminator veteran Gene Warren, greatly expanded the future war sequences from the first film. Combining live-action combat sequences with effects photography, artists created the massive battlefield for the war between man and machine. The famous endoskeleton also returns for the sequel. Stan Winston's company joined forces with stop-motion animator Peter Kleinow to create an army of these high-tech death figures. It's the same endoskeleton. It's basically the same design. We have finessed it, but it's much more technically advanced than the endoskeleton in the first movie. It's actually artistically advanced. They can do more. There's more life to these endoskeletons. But redesigning the original endoskeleton was only the beginning for Stan Winston and staff. In this particular movie, we had to duplicate every principal actor animatronically. In the scene where the Terminator must force his way past a SWAT firing squad, Stan was called upon to create an Arnold double that could withstand a barrage of gunfire. There's nothing that we can do that will actually duplicate living things. We can come close, but we can't do it exactly. It's incredible, huh? It's working good. Yeah. For this, Fantastic. consider the fact that it's going to be uh, shots. It'll only be on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> we are making animatronic duplications of living things. Two, three, four, perfect. Very nice. <laughs> it's just a movie. What? Okay, you don't get paid. So what? I make it for you, okay? Relax. <laughs> for Sarah's nightmare, Winston's crew designed and created several duplicates of Linda Hamilton all of which were destroyed in the creation of the haunting nuclear sequence. Honey. Destroying Los Angeles was a task given to forward productions under the direction of Bob Skotak. Vast miniature cityscapes were built in tremendous detail for the sole purpose of their destruction. But the truly revolutionary effects involve creating the T-1000, the deadliest machine ever built. It just blew my mind. Um, to actually see it and you go, wow, they've morphed you. You're, you're a liquid mercury man, you're liquid chrome. I, I don't think I'll get over it, and I, I, uh, I totally believed it. Creating the T-1000 required the combined efforts of Stan Winston's company and Industrial Light and Magic, under the direction of Dennis Muren. 
at the beginning of this show, Jim had the boards already done. And you have to start with storyboards. You have to know what you're doing at the beginning. Can it even be done? A show like this, you know, is it technically feasible to even do it now? Uh, and Jim was hoping it was, and I thought it was. You know, so we all agreed that we could do it. It was a constant, you know, little juggling act in the very beginning to figure out what was going to be done optically, what was going to be done as a real life effect, and then what things from us would be needed for ILM to help them work things out optically, and vice versa. And it was, uh, it just worked out as perfect as it possibly could have. When the T-1000's abilities went beyond what was possible with animatronics, makeup, and prosthetics, ILM was given the task of creating the effects optically, literally redefining state-of-the-art for computer animation. Computer-generated images are a way of coming up with new effects, especially when we've been doing traditional effects for 80 years. And you're starting to see, I think, a lot of sort of the limits of traditional effects, sort of the they're, you know, it's very hard to use the same tools and do the different things all the time. And Dennis and I sat down and conceived the process, and we sort of decided to concentrate on the Robert Patrick form, because Robert is the T-1000. We just what we decided, we're going to study his body, we're going to watch his movements, we're going to find a way to capture his quality, his, the way he walks, the way he runs, the way he behaves, the way his body changes shape. And that was for us was going to be the key that drove uh, our visual approach to the, to the whole T-1000. At the making of the models, the studying Robert Patrick, we got Robert and he was up here and we painted a grid on him and shot a lot of footage of him and we could see how the how the grid moved as his muscles moved and his body's moved around. Way, that was way back in the beginning of the show. And so that gives you an extremely powerful guide for creating a real Robert Patrick walk, a real Robert Patrick uh, run, which is in fact the T-1000 walk, the T-1000 run. So it's absolutely critical to our whole process. We're trying to always duplicate human beings. Everybody's shooting for human beings. This is really the first successful step to adding real life to an otherwise inanimate piece of geometry. You know, it's the wrinkles, you know, it's the slight mannerisms of the eyes and the hands and stuff, just like a real human. That's the kind of thing, that's the extra step we wanted to take. It, we were destined to do that or nothing. We knew that other people had come so far, we wanted to go beyond that. I dabbled in this a little bit uh, in the abyss with the uh, water tentacle that formed uh, the faces of Ed Harris and Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. And that proved to be very compelling uh, imagery that people remembered indelibly from that movie. So that um, kind of encouraged me to take it a step further, or many steps further. As on the abyss, ILM employed a revolutionary laser scanning process to capture Robert Patrick's movements and form. And one of the most powerful ways, or one of the most uh, exciting ways to use it, is to get people's facial expressions in the computer. I'm sitting in a chair, you know, like this, and I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't move this way, I can't move this way. I've got to stay totally controlled, hit this emotion, and lock on this expression, you know, like, ah. Uh. We can reconstruct the actor's face. It's, very, it's a very free process. You can sort of go with what's happening and digitize those expressions as you wish. And, uh, and we can immediately work with them, animate, model, create human, very realistic, very strong human uh, faces. Get out. I mean, we work on this stuff, and every day, you know, we still have not lost the spirit of, of, of amazement when we see what's coming out. It's new. Um, and that's what's necessary, is we can't have a sequel and just have it more of the same. There's some wonderful new surprises in Terminator 2. Bringing the T-1000 to life has been a group effort. I knew I was in good hands, like with ILM and, and Stan Winston. I knew I was working with the best of the best. And uh, I'd just like to thank them and uh, the crew and my cast members. Terminator was heralded as the science fiction film of the decade. Seven years later, stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton and visionary director James Cameron have created one of the largest movies ever, the conclusion of the Terminator saga. 
For cast and crew, Terminator 2 was nothing short of destiny. Hasta la vista, baby. Thank you.